Hello, everyone. Thanks a lot for joining this session. I'm Benedict. I'm a scientist with Resolve Biosciences, and I'm excited to take this opportunity to tell you more about our molecular cartography platform. What this technology is really all about is about giving you single molecule coordinates uh, for the transcripts of up to 100 genes um, in your tissue of interest. So these are highly um, spatially resolved coordinates uh, with a resolution of roughly 250 nanometers. Um, two examples of how that looks in the end, um, you can see here. So on the left, we have a reptilian brain. Uh, and on the right, we have a 120 hours post fertilization uh, zebrafish hat. So we have a neuro neurobiology and a developmental sample. And each one of these tiny dots that you can see here, a few hundred thousands in case of the zebrafish and millions in case of the, the much larger reptilian brain, is the, the precise position of one trans single transcript in space. And you can do a lot of cool things with this. And um, one other thing to look at, which is what is, I think, the, the benchmark for spatial technologies in general, is the mouse brain. So let's have a look at this um, because that probably allows you uh, to, to get the best impression of this, what this technology can, uh, can do in comparison to others. So what we looked at here um, is, like I said, a mouse brain. You have a bright field image, image on the left. You have an annotation for, from the Allen Brain Atlas on, on the right. And what we targeted here was a, was a panel, um, a custom-made panel um, of 100 genes, different cell type markers, different pathway markers that, that are uh, of relevance in the brain. Um, what we were able to detect is around 10 million single molecules in, in this area that I've highlighted on the left. And even by just showing these in, in pretty much random colors, we can see that we beautifully recapture the structure of the spring that, that is given by the Alan Atlas on, on the right. And this is really because of several aspects. Uh, for one, our technology is very specific. And the patterns that we see here, for example, at, at the bottom, um, recaptures what uh, very precisely what has already been, been, been published on the mouse brain, which is, of course, a very well studied um, structural um, structural model in, in this field, even I, I think I can say. Um, so what you have on the, on, on the top, standard old school, old school in situ hybridization from a paper that many of you might, might have already read. And you can see the, the cortical layers um, that these um, signals show up in that assay are exactly the same as, as in the data set that I just showed you, just that we're not looking at genes one by one, but that we're doing 100 in one go. And in that same data set in the cortex, um, we also compare very well quantitatively to other technologies like RNA sequencing even. Um, so what you can see here is really that no matter if the gene is very, very lowly expressed, right, we're talking TPMs, below one or highly expressed TPMs above 100, uh, we get a really nice linear correlation going with, uh, with RNA sequencing of 0.9, although we're looking at uh, a completely unmatched mouse in this case, and this is really pulled straight from the database. And the reason we get this very nice detection of low, really highly expressed genes is that we really detect um, a lot of RNA molecules. We have a very good sensitivity going that is comparable really to the gold standard out there, which is still single color, single molecule fish. Um, so if we make this comparison, this is just one example from cell culture with lowly and highly expressed genes, you can really see that we can pick up just as many molecules as you could with, with such a technology. So we really think that, uh, that we pick up most of the things that, that, that are in the sample, although this ground truth is of course very difficult to define all this. And this allows us to really see a lot of spatial patterns. Um, at the high level, this um, could be used as, um, well, an, an, uh, a complementary technology, but also a replacement for immunohistochemistry because we see exactly the same patterns in our essays that you would have in such an essay. So this is from, from mouse liver, where you have all of these different vessels. So these, these are the dark areas in the image. And then I've highlighted here a few genes that are that are shared between these um, between these uh, these two tissues um, that were used here. And as you can see, we can really not only see genes in in the same place if we compare glue and on on both cases uh, on both sides, for example. Uh, but this actually allows us to do the same definition of different blood vessels um, that you would with immunohistochemistry, but only using a tiny fraction really of these large panels that we can run. And we can also compare favorably if we look at uh, immunohistochemistry, if we go to the, to the single cell level, right? Which is where 
I think all of these spatial stories start to become interesting. So here are markers for um, stellite cells, uh, Desmond, uh, as well as kupfer cells, that's CLAC4. Um, those are um, liver macrophages, but not quite macrophages. But as you can see in the immunohistochemistry, these are really cells that are very closely interwoven. So they, they, um, they really have these, these very nice uh, cell pairs that they're forming. And we can actually recapture exactly the same thing with, with our data, just that we can look at a lot more transcripts at once, of course. Uh, and that what we generate is fully quantitative and not just a color yes or color no kind of assay. And um, coming back to this mouse brain, that really allows us to define many of the structures that you see here, right? So this is just looking at the different layers of the mouse cortex uh, from layer one up top to layer 6b that is very much at the bottom, um, represented here by the marker CCN2. And this really just requires 13 markers in this case. You could even do with, with less. Um, it looks quite nice, but this is of course still at the pretty much at the macro level. This is a few millimeters thick. Things become more interesting when, uh, when I probably show you um, how we uh, perform when we do cell typing. So this is now showing all of our glutamatergic neurons or markers thereof in red. A lot of them all over the place, just like you would expect. But then in this sea of red, we can detect other cell types by, by, by the markers highlighted here in different colors. So for example, gabaritic neurons in, uh, in yellow. And you can really see that these islands are really very nicely um, separated from, from the sea of red. Um, so the, this shows you a little bit already, a first glimpse of how high our spatial resolution actually is. And what exemplifies that even better um, is, is what I'm showing here. So this is now just, just zooming in on just four markers out of our 100 for um, GABAergic inhibitory neurons. So you have GAT1, which is expressed in all GABAergic neurons in the cortex. And then you have a selection of PVALP, SST, or VIP that can be um, co-expressed with them. That's pretty much what we detect here. Um, and the really cool thing, I think, in this image is that you see these little lines going away from these cells. So those are the cell projections that, of course, neurons do have. Um, and we have animated this a little bit here on the right. Uh, just to show this, those to you a bit, bit, bit nicer, and this really shows that we can uh, not even not only say these transcripts belong to the cell, but we can actually see which guys here are in cell projections and which are more in the cell body. But it also shows you our typical data because this is our typical data. It is completely three dimensional. It's giving you a point cloud through your whole uh, through your whole section, uh, and really allows you to do very very cool things. Uh, many of which I, I think we probably haven't even thought about yet. So we're really looking forward to more and more people using this technology. And with this high spatial resolution that, that I think I just showed you, um, you can now do a lot of very cool things. And I think use that as a stepping stone really to integrate that with data sets that you might already have. Um, so one thing that we and many of our early access customers were interested in is comparing this to single cell RNA sequencing. And you can do that in a very straightforward manner. The, the easiest would be to use DAPI in the experiment, which we routinely do, and use this to segment out cells right, and assign them to individual nuclei, i.e. cells. If we do that, then in this panel, we detect um, a few hundred uh, individual molecules for each cell. So we can actually do, do lots of statistics with that. Um, and we can actually do many of the things or even use the pipelines that are also commonly used by uh, single cell RNA sequencing. So this is all using CIRAT, which I think is one of the main tools in that space. So we can do things like UMAP plots and cluster cells based on their transcriptome um, and figure out the different cell types we have in there. We can generate heat maps, all that good stuff. But the really cool thing is that this is not where our analysis stops because we have the spatial component, right? So for each of these clusters, uh, we can determine exactly where that the cells in this cluster in each individual cell was located in space. And although the analysis that I'm showing here is purely transcriptomic and did not take any um, spatial data into account during clustering, you can see that most of these clusters are really highly spatially distributed, uh, really showing how, how important like spatial anal analyses are and will be in, in the future. And if we just break it down from this random flushing that was on the screen before, and I'll look at, look at all the cell types that are actually represented by these clusters, you can again see these, these very beautiful um, patterns and uh, how we can clearly de delineate different like, superstructures in the brain, but also how the, how the cells in them 
differ from one another. And again, fully quantitative, right? Just like the, the single transcripts that this is based on, of course. Um, so if we look at the cortex only here, we can see exactly what you would expect from the literature, lots of glutamatergic neurons, but we can even detect very rare and very small cells like, like microglia at that. Um, very, very well, and these show up exactly as, as often as they should in the mouse cortex. And this is very nice, but we really consider this more of a proof of concept, right? Uh, that's really what the mouse brain is becoming more and more. Um, but it's really just a stepping stone to now do some actual biology. So a case study for this, um, for us, is uh, Alzheimer's disease. So in Alzheimer's disease, we are using a model mouse here, APPPS1, for the Alzheimer's aficionados uh, among you. Um, you have a formation of these amyloid plaques. And in mouse, these are closely associated with disease-associated microglia um, that differ from homeostatic microglia because they're in hyperactive state. And in parts, they're actually causing uh, these plaques and are one of the causative agents for the neuronal damage that happens in, in Alzheimer's. So this is a very, very spatial disease. And we can see that uh, when in, in our technology very well. So what we did here is we actually compared a, a wild type and an APPP as one model mouse. And we did not only run molecular cartography, uh, but after the assay, uh, since the whole thing is non-destructive, the tissue, all the proteins, everything you want to probe is still there. Uh, so we did that just that and detected amyloid plaques with the diet called PFTA. And if we do that then and just score bulk differential expression between these tissues, um, you can right away see this, this spatial character of the disease, right? Because all the genes that are enriched in, in, in an Alzheimer's model mouse are located right around these plaques. And this has been well established in literature, of course. Um, you can see it if you, if you do more basic RNA scope, uh, but you can see it even better with our technology with the single molecule resolution, of course, with, uh, with the multiplexing. Uh, and since this is all digital, uh, this allows us to do some, some very cool spatial analysis. So in this case, what we went and did was uh, we segmented out 600 plaques from, from, different, uh, from different animals, and we just drew concentric circles around these plaques that all had the same area. Um, so that allows us to, allowed us to just count how many genes of any given point uh, types show up in these plaques going, going away from the, uh, in the, in these circles going away from the plaques, and allows us to quantify how frequently each transcript shows up uh, closer and further away from the plaque. And here we clearly see uh, microglial markers being rich at the plaque, like C1QA, and um, neuronal markers like SIG1 being decreased at the plaques because of this neuronal loss that we're seeing, which is at the transcript level, right? But um, so if you would do the similar analysis at the, the cell level, right, you can also do this very, very uh, efficiently. So what we did, we segmented out cells. Uh, again, a few tens of thousand cells um, performed human co uh, performed co clustering with uh, with wild type and uh, model cells. So we can, of course, se separate these by transcriptome, but also a little bit by pathology. But the really cool thing is now that we know for each and every one of these cells how close they are to the nearest plaque. And if you do that kind of analysis, um, you can see patterns emerge emerging. So in this case, for example. Uh, I think you can relatively appreciate that one of the two microglial clusters um, that we've indicated here uh, is actually um, significantly enriched at plux, while there's a second cluster which is actually far away from plux. So we can see differences uh, in heterogeneity within the cell population. Um, and then, of course, we can count cells, we can see the neural loss, we can see the enrichment of microglia globally in this tissue, but we can also count very precisely which cell type is how enriched and how disenriched are these plaques. And we can even do things like measure the, the size of the, the, the plaque niche, right? Um, which is very important, of course, um, for, for such a disease. So what we see in this case, for example, is microglia are really enriched in the last 10 micrometers to the plaque, so really touching, touching the plaque, uh, while then the neuronal damage is actually happening up to 30, 40 micrometers away from the plaque. So you can really see this effect of disease associated microglia potentially right at the plaque wreaking havoc then for, uh, for the neurons that, that are further away by triggering lots of pathways in, in the brain there. And let's look at this spatially because graphs are, are, are really something very nice that you can get out of spatial technologies, but I, I think uh, looking at the actual images is even more convincing. 
So we focus on, on two, two cell types here, uh, astrocytes and microglia, both the disease associated uh, um, variety for microglia or reactive astrocytes that are actively involved in processes, uh, in, well, in, in immune processes, as well as more hemostatic astrocytes and microglia. What you can see very nicely, I think, is that in the, in the wild type mouse, there is no disease associated with microglia, pretty much, exactly like you would expect. And all of your reactive astrocytes are at the periphery of the tissue, which is where your, your antigens would actually be coming in uh, and turning these into reactive astrocytes. While then, if you look at the model mouse, this picture changes completely. You suddenly have your reactive astrocytes in red all over the place, not just at the periphery. Um, and you start seeing your disease associated microglia around these plaques, but you also still retain your hemostatic microglia. So this is a really cool data set, a starting data set, to now start comparing the spatial distribution of all these different cell types in relation to neurons and how their transcript cells change because of the, the co-localization of, of all of these cells, which is something that, that is ongoing right now. And that we're actually expanding uh, to human samples uh, so we can do the same there, con, uh, control patient, uh, well, healthy, healthy tissue on the left, uh, and uh, uh, BRAC6 late stage uh, Alzheimer's sample on the right, where we can see exactly the same neuronal loss while we actually retain many of these green microglial markers um, in there. So the brain is really an awesome um, tissue to, to do many of these analyses with. But it's not prototypic necessarily um, for, for all the tissues in the body, right? So you have the brain, oh, things like the skin probably as well, where you really have these, uh, these layers of different cell types. But then you have other tissues like liver um, that look very, very different. So in liver, you don't have these layers that much. So let, let's see how molecular cartography performs there. Uh, so this is looking at three different liver samples. 100 genes, completely randomly colored. A main message here is if we do Pearson correlation between these very close to one, so we are really very, very reproducible. And actually a correlation with an unmatched RNA-seq sample, uh, 0.97, which I think uh, says a lot about our quantitative potential also in liver, um, which, 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 which we are actually very, very proud of. So we are, again, very uh, reproducible and very quantitative. So what can we do with that spatially? Um, so this is the, the spatial distribution of, of 10 example genes in, in, in liver. And what I think becomes readily apparent that you have different zones in this liver. And actually the transition from zone to zone is much more gradual um, than you've probably seen in other tissues. Um, so close to this vessel, I've zoomed in on one of them, you have markers like, like VWF that are, of course, for, for the cells lining the blood vessels. So that's an actual layer. But then after it, it becomes a bit more fuzzy. So you have this glue for like two or three cell layers and tapering off. And you can see the same for CYP2E1 just a bit further out. And then after that, the CYP2E1 slowly tapers out. You have actually a completely different domain that has other transcript signatures. So this has been very well studied in, in, in literature, of course, but with much lower complexity. Um, so where we can see for CYP2E1, for example, that it's stretching out eight, 10 cell layers and glue is essentially stuck to the first one or two, exactly the same in, 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 in single molecule fish, um, which, which of course um, shows uh, our specificity again here. Um, but this is really indicative of, of what's happening in this tissue. So what's happening is um, you have these vessels, uh, they're called central veins and, and portal veins. I, I've annotated two of them here. And you really have liquid cross flow between them from, from portal vein to central vein. And that really changes the, the character of the, of the hepatocytes um, in, a, in a gradual fashion from, from one vessel to the other. So while all most of the cells that you can see here are hepatocytes, we just highlight the markers here in red. Uh, and of course, we can also see all the others, uh, these other cells around. We can also segment them out and see exactly the same patterns that we have. Um, these changes in the transcriptomes of hepatocytes actually um, form these gradients um, that are part of the, of the, of the liver zonation. And this is much less of a, a layer structure like you have in the brain, um, but more gradual. At least that's, that's what you can see here. Um, so this is another completely different tissue from brain, um, but we're, we're totally performing here um, very, very well. And the same is true for, for completely different tissues. So this is a, this is a muscle example uh, where we did molecular cartography on, on mouse heart. Where again, you have one predominant cell type 
and then you have these 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 islands of expression of, of different other types of cells uh, like smooth muscle cells here here in blue and can beautifully look at the structures here and the, and the changes in gene expression giving different conditions uh, and treatments of, of these samples. And all of this work is now paying off more and more. Uh, so several of, of our early access customers uh, and of our collaborators now have, uh, have papers under review. Uh, so uh, watch, your, watch your Google Scholar or your PubMed. There's going to be a lot of molecular cartography going to be in, in, in there very soon. One of the papers that is, uh, that is almost further along is from our collaboration with Natalie Yurishyaksi in, uh, in Trondheim in Norway. So what, what they looked at are multiciliated ependymal cells. Now they already had RNA single cell RNA-seq results for all that, but they're really missing a, a spatial component, a spatial pattern here. And what our experiment allowed them to say very, very easily uh, was that they could see which different markers actually characterize these cells and how these cells differ uh, in the midline and in the choroid plexus, uh, where they were su su expecting these cells to be. Uh, but with their previous data, couldn't really make out what, what is where. And that worked really awesome there. It's a very nice story. Uh, it's impressed. So pre please, please have a look when it comes out. Um, and this is just using, I think in, in this image, it's showing five genes out of a panel of, again, 100 genes that we looked at here. So we can't really wait to, to see what else they, they come up with uh, in the deeper analysis that they, that they now do on this, on this awesome data set. And they and, and other key, um, customers basically choose Resolve because of three main features. Uh, so first of all, we have a very, very good uh, sensitivity. So we can even detect subtle changes in, uh, in gene expression. Um, we can do that at cellular and subcellular resolution and really specifically assign, uh, assign transcripts to, to different cells. And which is, I think, very unique also from some of the other people you, you might have listened to, um, to during this conference is that our technology is completely non-destructive. So we're not doing any tissue clearing things um, to, to make our imaging better. And we're not like treating the samples with prot K to make penetration of, of our probes better. Uh, but the tissue really stays intact. So there's plenty of things left to, to probe with antibodies and, and hopefully do metabolomics or lipidomics with um, in the future. So I said the word probes, and you've seen the data. So you probably uh, already, at least in this um, very well-educated audience, have figured out that I'm talking indeed about a SMFish-based technology. So it's a comparable a com a combinatorial single molecule fish approach. So what we started with are cultured cells on a glass slide or uh, tissue sections up to 10 micrometers thick. And then we hybridize a few tens of different probes to our 100 target transcript species. And the really cool thing is that we can tack and destain um, these with, with fluorophores. So we can add and remove fluorophores as much as we want. Uh, those actually don't leave behind any, um, uh, any residues. So we can actually use, reuse these probes uh, as much as we want uh, and do several rounds of imaging. And that allows us to, of course, generate a code that allows us to identify different transcripts, even with just very few different fluorescent channels. So we just image these a bunch of time, pretty naively record images, uh, and then just have a computer decode them. And then in this case, transcript A would have been any single molecule signal that showed up in the green channel twice, twice in the red channel, green, and then red again. And our code here is very versatile, actually. Uh, uh, it's very error robust, and it really gives us very nice signals with uh, ridiculously low false positive rates, um, well below 0.5 or 0.1 even in, in most of the experiments that we look at. And all of this um, is something that, uh, that we're very proud of. So we have validated this in a number of species and tissues, only some of which really a small subset I've shown to you today. Like I said, we can do up to 100 genes in parallel at the moment. Uh, watch this space. Uh, we can do this, uh, of course, mostly in 2D, but we actually have a 3D component in all of our data. Um, we have very nice bioinformatics tools to both do analysis locally on a customer's computer to have as much versatility as possible uh, in, for new applications that they come up with. But we are also uh, have a web tool available. We have completely digital data. So what you get in the end is, in essence, a text file that has coordinates for all the transcripts. Uh, as well as a quality score associated to each of them. 
Um, our technology, since it's non-destructive, is very amenable to multiplexing with, with other technologies. Uh, I don't want to use the word multi-omics, but you can definitely start uh, going towards antibodies and, and all that good stuff. Um, it also is very sensitive because we're not using any enzymes or, or anything that would um, like do, do strange things to, to a signal, let's say. Many of you know, know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, and we're actually developing a device, or we already have a device running internally, that allows us to do this at very high throughput. So we do this on, on glass slides that have, have eight different tissue placement positions. And we can run up to um, three of these slides in one single experiment, um, allowing us to look at things very, very rapidly and actually directly compare samples in one experiment in sec in, instead of having to do multiple ones, uh, one after the other, which we think is very, very convenient. And this convenience is something that we want to bring to the community as quickly as possible. So some of the first devices will actually already be placed by the end of this year uh, in select uh, partner labs. Um, but what we already have online right now um, is a service offering. Um, so that would be based on whoever is interested, hopefully some of you in the audience, uh, getting in touch with us. There's contact details at the end of this talk and uh, you're free to visit our website, of course, please do that. Um, just get in touch with us. And then what we would talk about is what tissue you're interested in. We provide you with a protocol for that and you would get access to our online probe design tool. That is ridiculously easy to use. So it's mainly copy pasting a list of genes that you're interested in into that tool, uh, making a few selections in case you're uh, interested in specific isoforms um, or something like this. Uh, if you press a button, probes are designed. Um, you can make a few more selections. Uh, and then actual um, procur procurement of the probes, uh, prepping them for experiment will be done on our end. Your task is to place your, your tissue sections on a glass slide that we would provide and ship to you. And then all of that is, is combined in our labs, your shipment on dry ice, uh, all it goes from our suppliers. Um, we would run the experiment and provide you with uh, A, the data, so the transcript coordinates, images, to put these transcript coordinates into a context. So that is DAPI as standard, but we have also tried membrane states and a variety of other things. And we would give you then access to our analysis tools um, that you can really use to make very, very awesome analyses. And our data in general is so open uh, that you can then go crazy after that and really build completely own uh, pipelines around what you want to do and plug it also in some of the already existing spatial analysis tools that maybe people at this conference are also presenting. So um, that's all I wanted to share with you. Thanks a lot for listening. Um, get in touch, follow us on social media. Um, we have service labs active in both Germany, which is where our HQ is, as well as in California and San Jose. Um, so wherever you're listening to us, I assume most of you are in the US. Um, that should not be an issue. Space uh, is not an issue for us as a spatial company, of course. Um, so if you want to know more about how exactly that works, how do we prep samples, uh, how can you analyze our data and like spatial data in general, please stick around to the next two talks uh, that my colleagues Jeroen and Frank will give. And uh, I hope to talk to many of you soon and hopefully in person. Thank you very much for listening. Hi, welcome. Thank you very much for joining this session on mastering tissue preparation. My name is Jeroen Art, and I'm a customer technology advisor. So today I will talk about how to prepare the best tissues, how to freeze them, how to cut them, uh, really to achieve the best spatial transcriptomic data output uh, possible. Um, so today I will not talk about uh, our, what we're doing at Resolve Biosciences from a technology standpoint. So this was very nicely exp uh, explained by my colleague Benedict, really showcasing what our technology platform can do and how um, what type of data that comes out of that. But of course, it all starts with um, good samples and dealing with many, many customers uh, at Resolve. I, I've noticed that it's not always clear what are the best methodologies to approach this. Um, just uh, freezing a sample can be interpreted quite differently to many people, but also cutting the sample is really often more an, an art than a science. So I, I want to uh, use this opportunity 
to go over some tips and tricks and some troubleshooting that may help many people uh, achieve a better sample preparation and also generally will help the spatial biology community have uh, better experiments and better data output. So today I want to focus on really the step-by-step -step, uh, protocol, um, more focused on fresh frozen samples. Um, I will also talk a bit about uh, fixation methods and also FFPE samples, but generally uh, how to proceed from a dissected tissue section to really freeze it, cut it on a cryostat, and then of course proceed with a spatial transcriptomics technology. And of course you have many um, very powerful spatial transcriptomics, uh, transcriptomics technologies. And I advise you to tune in tomorrow on a talk I give together with my colleague uh, Jasper about all these different um, uh, chemistries and platforms that are available and how they might uh, suit your uh, research needs. But today, as I mentioned, so we can go over uh, tissue freezing and also cry sectioning in uh, more detail. So tissue freezing, I think one essential component of freezing a freshly dissected uh, uh, tissue is really the speed. So typically when you have slow freezing, uh, what happens actually is within your cells, within your tissue, you get ice crystal formation. And uh, this is causing what we call the Swiss cheese effect. You can see it in the right image here where you really have, the name says it for itself, really have these holes inside the tissue. And how does that happen? Well, basically these ice crystals that form, they really cut open the membranes of the, the cells and your cells basically burst open, they die. And this really heavily impacts your morphology. So slow freezing is a thing to avoid. And then of course the question is, how can you achieve fast freezing? Now, fast freezing, I think many of you will think about liquid nitrogen. And this is an all time classic um, freezing method where because it's so cold, you just put in your tissue and then it's frozen and you can use it for any type of analysis. So it's great for snap freezing when you're interested in uh, bulk RNA-seq or any type of other bulk uh, assay. But for spatial, for histology purposes, it's actually not very good. So it's really to be avoided uh, for histology, although with some exceptions for very small samples. And the reason why I mentioned that is that, let's say if you want to freeze your tissue with liquid nitrogen, what actually happens is that the contact with warm tissues actually locally boils the uh, liquid nitrogen and you create a vapor barrier, a vapor shell around your uh, sample. So when that happens, um, the liquid nitrogen cannot penetrate the tissue uh, very well or not evenly. So the tissue does not cool evenly. And what happens is you, you get these cracks, you get uneven freezing, your tissue sometimes even explodes. Um, so that's really to be avoided. Histology is all about the best preservation of your cellular um, and tissue morphology into uh, in, in your tissue. Of course, this effect with the vapor shell, it does produce very cool um, science videos as depicted here. So this is an image from a video where a person sticks his hand in liquid nitrogen in a very fast way. If you pull it out, you actually don't uh, feel anything. You don't have burns, uh, not to be tried at home, but that's a demonstration of what it actually means to have let's say that uh, vapor barrier around a warm tissue that you uh, freshly dissected in, 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 uh, uh, in this case. So um, this is really what liquid nitrogen uh, does. So not good for histology. So what is good for histology? Well, I think the golden standard method of freezing down tissues for histology is the use of um, isopentane and so this liquid when you cool it down to approximately minus 55 degrees celsius it penetrates the tissue very evenly you don't have any problems with this um, vapor barrier and, and 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 or a cracking of the tissue so it's really perfect for histology purposes and thus also very good uh, suited for our spatial transcriptomics uh, essays that we want to perform so how do you actually uh, do that? So how do you use isopentane to freeze tissues? Well, um, you basically have a styrofoam box with a beaker. You pour in the um, isopentane liquid, which is commercially available. 
And so in this beaker, you just pour in uh, a bottom of a couple of centimeters high. This is sufficient for most tissues. And you really uh, put it on uh, uh, dry ice in the styrofoam box. And the way to cool it down ideally is actually to have a thermometer where you stir the liquid. Otherwise you will have part of the liquid at the bottom, which, which is very cold, and then a, a layer on top, which is uh, uh, much warmer. If you then put in a tissue, you mix warm and colder solutions. It's not good for even, even freezing. So um, having a thermometer where you can stir and track the, the temperature is ideal. And so you can bring it down to uh, minus 50, uh, 55 degrees Celsius, more or less, which is the, the best temperature to freeze. So the next step, what I usually do, so you have your isopentane cooling down, everything is going uh, according to plan. So before you even start uh, preparing your samples for freezing, I actually prepare um, these um, rectangular or square pieces of aluminum foil to write down the uh, sample information on top. And I place these pieces of aluminum foil on an, a second box of dry ice. So this is really to wrap the um, the uh, frozen tissue and to store it in minus 80 degrees. So when you dissect your uh, tissue, um, so you can actually um, place them on these uh, chemical weighing trays. And a trick here is to actually uh, cut out a piece of the weighing tray as displayed here. And this allows you to really quickly also remove the uh, isopentane when retrieving the sample. It's it's more like a carrier for your sample. I like this uh, method a lot. Alternatively, there's of course also the method of cryo embedding and this has these special cryo molds. You have them in different sizes, different shapes. So you can put in your uh, tissue and fill it up with OCT and then also uh, directly freeze it in the isopentane solution. So you basically put either this cryo mold or let's say the tissue on the, the chemical weighing tray and you put it directly in the liquid and wait about, let's say 30 seconds, a minute with the cryo molds a bit longer. So maybe up until two minutes to uh, really uh, freeze it completely. It turns white, solid. You will see that it's frozen uh, thoroughly. So after that, you just retrieve uh, the tissue from the isopentane and using the chemical tray, you can decant the liquid uh, and really um, take the um, tissue with a frozen uh, forceps and place it on the aluminum foil that has been kept on dry ice, very cool. And then um, you can see here that I wrap it like a piece of candy. You just wrap it uh, around the tissue and place it on dry ice. So after this step, basically your tissue is frozen, ready to um, be prepared for cryosectioning and really obtaining nice sections for uh, spatial transcriptomics. So then on to cryosectioning. So how does a cryostat actually look like? Well, the most important components are within the cryostat chamber, which is cooled to about minus 20 uh, degrees. So you have these um, um, sample holders uh, where you can put on OCT, which is like a glue. It solidifies with minus 20 degrees or uh, below zero degrees. And you can actually use that OCT compound to really glue your sample on top of those stubs. And you can place that in the object near the knife. So this is um, here centrally, uh, you can see the knife. Um, and on top of the knife, which is quite important, is the anti-roll guide. So this helps you really stretch the tissue when it comes in contact, when it's being cut by the knife, it stretches your tissue. And this allows you to really have a nice morphology when you put it on the glass slide. And on top of uh, the cryostat are, uh, of course, controls, controlling the temperature, the knife, and the positioning. So please consult your uh, the manual of your device to have more specific uh, information on this. So the first thing you need to do is really place all the materials inside the cryostat chamber at least 30 minutes before you start uh, sectioning. This is really important to allow the sample to equilibrate to the same temperature as the cryostat chamber. Otherwise, the sample is way too cold when it comes from the minus 80 or directly from dry ice. And that really affects the uh, ability to cut your sample with, uh, with good histology. But aside from the sample also, Put in brushes, a scalpel, forceps, 
and in the case of spatial transcriptomics it's important to also um, cool down the glass light in the cryo uh, cryostat uh, chamber. So important, this is shown here. These are um, glass lights we use at Resolve Biosciences for our molecular cartography technology. You place these glass lights inside the chamber. Uh, this is quite important because in the standard histology uh, workflow, you do not do this. You keep the glass lights at room temperature to allow for um, easy uh, section uh, capture on the glass light. But here we're dealing with uh, RNA, a very sensitive um, material on thin sections. So to preserve the RNA integrity, the quality, it's important to also cool it down. So the um, sections never reach a high enough temperature for a long time to degrade the RNA. So then on to uh, sectioning. So this is typically a normal protocol within a cryostat. You really um, just um, follow the instructions of the uh, instrument and try to cut uh, 10 micrometer sections. This is uh, for our technology, for example, the case for many others as well. 10 micrometer sections is, let's say, a standard here. And then on the left side, you can see the tissue section here uh, close to the knife and you use the anti-roll guide to really make thin sections that are stretched out or you can use your brush to really guide it across um, the knife. And then you actually use two brushes. So this is a method not to um, um, break glass lights when trying to capture it within, uh, within the cryostat chamber. Rather, you put the um, tissue section that you just cut with two brushes. You gently put it onto the glass light. And as you can see here, if you zoom in, you can actually see with two brushes, you can place it in the capture area, in the region of interest, where you need to put this, uh, the tissue section. But of course, this glass light is also cooled to the same temperature. So the tissue section will not adhere to the glass light. And that's a big difference between what I previously said, uh, when you have a glass light on room temperature, when you try to capture the tissue section, of course, it melts directly against the glass light. But this is, um, not the proper protocol for spatial transcriptomics. So here, both the tissue section and the glass light are on the, are on the same temperature, so you won't see the adhesion right away. So what needs to happen to accomplish this? So what you basically do is you take the glass light here with the tissue section on top. It's still lying there, not really at attached very well. But you use uh, plain um, body heat in the form of a finger that you put on the other side of the glass light. And you, uh, you don't really press against it, but you just hold it and you let the, the heat of your finger transfer onto the glass. And then you actually will see a change from a white section to a section that almost disappears on your glass light. It's really, um, yeah, it's really melted against the glass light and it becomes a bit transparent. And immediately after that, if you ensure that all the edges of the tissue are also nicely melted against the glass light, you actually put the glass light right back onto a flat surface within the cryostat chamber. So the glass light should never leave the cryostat chamber. Um, it needs to be uh, cool at all times. And then um, you can see that on the metal surface here, the uh, section actually starts freezing again. So this is just two pictures taken uh, maybe a second apart. And you can see actually it freezes and it's, it's quite nice to see, but this allows you to preserve the RNA integrity to the best uh, possible um, quality. But of course, it doesn't always go as planned. Uh, cryosectioning, I think, is more an art than a science. But for users that don't have a lot of experience, it's very useful to learn to see when it goes wrong and how to solve it. So the most common problems that you can occur that can occur with cryosectioning is, for example, um, curled up tissue. So you have you see these waves in your tissue section and this very often means that your temperature is too warm. So the best way to deal with that is just decrease the temperature of the cryostat by a few degrees. Just wait a bit, try again and you should see some smoother sections um, being generated. Another uh, common problem 
is impurities on the knife or a little nick in the knife, a damaged knife or a knife that's not clean, uh, you will see that also this is an H&E stain, but you will see it in uh, forming your sections that you will see these vertical stripes along the cutting angle that tears up uh, your tissue. So replace the knife accordingly or uh, move up the uh, knife to an unused section when you use these uh, disposable uh, knives. And then the last thing I want to mention is when your temperature is way too cold, so that's the opposite of the first problem, you will see these um, parallel stripes, these horizontal stripes appearing in your tissue, a uh, bit of cracks in your tissue section. So um, when you see that, just increase the temperature again with a few degrees, wait a while and then uh, section again. So you will um, see more smooth sections appearing from then on. Okay, so we covered fresh frozen, we covered cryosectioning. So of course there are other considerations. What if you cannot um, have fresh frozen samples and what to do with, for example, other uh, sample preparation methods. So for example, many users, they uh, have protocols in place for immunohistochemistry chemistry or other experiences with other technologies where you would need perfusion with um, uh, PFA. So when you have a perfused, for example, a perfused mouse brain, perfused with PFA that is fixed, so please do not directly proceed with uh, freezing it in isopentane. What you would need to do when you have a perfused or fixed tissue and you want to cut it on a cryostat, you will need to uh, protect it against those um, uh, ice crystals again. So you would need a cryoprotectant and how do we do that? So typically after your perfusion uh, with a fixative, you actually do a post fixation step uh, overnight uh, uh, with 4% 4 uh, 4 of uh, PFA. And to do a cryoprotection step, what you then do is actually incubate your tissue section in a sucrose solution. You can either directly go to 30% or do a gradient of 10%, 20% and 30%. Uh, it really depends on on uh, the type of tissue, for example, and some protocols just use uh, only the 30% sucrose. Um, to my knowledge, it does not make a huge difference, but what you need to be careful of is when you place your tissue um, after your PFA post fixation into a sucrose solution of 10 or 30%, you will see it floating on top. And what needs to happen is your water needs to be exchanged by these uh, sugars to prevent the ice crystal uh, formation when, uh, uh, when freezing. And to be sure that the um, exchange between water and sucrose has been sufficiently uh, done, you will see that the tissue will drop to the surface. Then you know, okay, um, um, sufficient water has been replaced and then you can actually do it go from the 10% to the 30% sucrose, do the same thing. And typically this takes an overnight step to really um, let the tissue float all the way down. And then you know there's sufficient sucrose into the tissue to really proceed with the uh, isopentane freezing methodology that I showed you uh, earlier. And of course, next to uh, PFA fixed tissue, fresh frozen, we also have formalin fixed paraffin embedded tissue. So these are tissues typically used uh, in, in patient samples, really in archiving, very important uh, methods to preserve samples. And also in Resolve, we're uh, really looking into um, getting the best spatial transcriptomics data out of these uh, tissue types, because it's extremely important to gain spatial information from these archived samples. Um, but of course, your spatial transcriptomics chemistry needs to be compatible with the paraffin embedding. That's one. And at Resolve Biosciences, so with the molecular cartography technology, it is compatible. But very important, and this is what we see across the industry, across the spatial biology field, is it really depends on the quality of the FFPE. So not all FFPE is created equal, of course. It depends on the storage condition and especially also on the length of storage. How long have these samples been stored? Because the longer they, they are stored, of course, the lower the RNA quality, the less the RNA is intact. So I think very important is to also 
map and generate data on the relation between your spatial transcriptomics technology and the RIN value, which is a value just for your RNA integrity. But very often, of course, this is taken in uh, as a bulk sample. You just chip away a piece of your uh, tissue block and you uh, measure the RIN value. And that is, let's say, a quality metric for the whole uh, tissue, also in the spatial dimension, which is in fact not completely true, of course. You can have spatial differences in a RIN value. And it was very nice to see a recent publication by uh, the lab of Joachim Lundberg that uh, is exploring a spatial RIN value. And um, I think this is very important and it's nice to see the spatial community um, developing tools to really assess um, RNA quality taking into account the spatial dimension. And the way um, um, this group uh, did that, and this is uh, published uh, quite recently, is really um, capturing the ribosomal RNA and having a fluorescent readout. And when you map that back onto the tissue, you actually see um, big differences in the RNA quality for a given section. So this tells you already, even within, let's say, an FFPE sample where you would consider this has low um, RIN values. It can be that in certain uh, parts of the tissue, the RNA quality is actually sufficiently high to perform a lot of these uh, spatial transcriptomics technologies. So I think it's a very nice evolution to see. And I think uh, um, many people in the spatial biology field uh, will learn from that how to deal with the quality control before proceeding with a spatial transcriptomics technology. And I will uh, conclude with that. So thank you everyone for tuning in. So if you have any questions, feel free to um, ask them now or contact us at Resolve Biosciences. We are really uh, eager and here to help scientists uh, make the best samples, make the best experiments and generate the best spatial transcriptomics data they can possibly can to really boost uh, their research output. So thanks a lot. Hello, everybody. My name is Frank Reinecke. I'm head of bioinformatics at Resolve Biosciences, and I will walk you through software solutions that help you to get to the ground truth with spatial transcriptomics data. I will quickly explain the data formats that we deal with and talk about two different software solutions that we have set up and the goal is to explore spatial transcriptomics data with open source tools that we provide easy access to to visualize the results and to conduct some exploratory analyses and basically the website helps you to cluster your cells by their expression profile and to visualize the results so map the cluster identity back to the original position of the cell or region of interest in your sample. A quick introduction to the data types that we deal with. The most important one is the images. During the processing, we generate a huge amount of image data, but most of these images are only transiently used because we decode the identity of the transcript by comparing the fluorescent signals in different images from different rounds. But all these images are basically not necessary for downstream analysis. So to do that, it's most of the time sufficient to use a bright field image and additional stainings like DAPI to detect nuclei in the, in the image, um, which are a lot easier to use. We also provide panorama images that are created by stitching the individual tiles of the microscope into the big picture. So the raw images that contain the Z layers in TIFF format are quite big. So they are 400 megabyte per tile. And as I said, the flattened and compressed panorama images are a lot smaller than that. The second type of data we deal with is the transcript location. And that is fairly simple. So we provide this information of the decoded transcripts in plain text format. Um, that's a that's a flat file that has five columns. One gives you the X, 
one the y and one the z coordinate in pixels of the panorama image, the transcript identity, that is commonly just the transcript name or the gene the transcript belongs to. And there's also a quality value that gives some information about the reliability of the decoding. So it's not a quantitative measure. Every line is one molecule. Uh, the quality value just gives some information about how sure we are that this transcript is actually correct. The third type of data that we deal with are regions of interest or ROIs. These are basically just path or shapes um, that can be drawn freehand, that can be deduced from uh, segmentation methods that take into account bright field images or DAPI and several other methods. So there's a wide variety how to generate regions of interest from images. And all of this is accessible because we embed the plugin in the ImageJ environment. So, and the most important uh, part is that we also integrate the region of interest manager and we can import and export regions and the intersect of the transcripts. So the shell by gene expression matrix. And our tool also provides a live counting of regions. So the, the expression content of a region is displayed in real time. As I said, we have two different software solutions. One is the ImageJ plugin and one is the website. Both have different advantages. So the ImageJ plugin, as I said, gives access to a wide variety of image manipulation and processing functions, a lot of plugins and well-known um, workflows to work with images, also to work with very large images, including Z-Stacks. The website is more focused on providing easy access to state-of-the-art statistical software packages. Um, we currently run Sura under the hood, so if a cell clustering is done, we actually use Sura to process the data through that. Uh, we feed back the cluster identity and display the cell colored by the, by the cluster identity in the original 3D context. We also have the, the famous uh, dimension reduction plots and we display the UMAP in three dimensions. Um, yes, and it's also easy to display and export gene expression by cluster in typically heat maps. Now I will walk you through the ImageJ plugin at first to get an idea how this is technically done. So first we will open image J and then we will load the bright field image and the DAPI image. These two images can be converted into two stacks. One channel will be converted into grayscale and the DAPI channel will be converted into blue. The brightness and the intensity can be adjusted to make the picture look nice. So now we have opened the Resolve Molecular Cartography plugin and the transcript list can be loaded by simply drag and drop the text file into the list box. And then we can select all transcripts they will initially be colored with default color wheel colors, um, which is not very informative, but we can very quickly see that the vast majority of transcripts is actually inside the cells that we see. And to start exploring the data, we have added a function that will run a co-localization analysis. This will basically provide a score if two transcripts are found near each other. And the scores are treated as a distance matrix and then this, they can be displayed as a heat map. They can also be displayed in the form of a dendrogram. 
And in this heat map, we can see two clusters of transcripts that obviously co-localize with each other. And these two groups are not found near each other, which is a bit surprising because the sample material we have used here is just HeLa cells. So it's one cell type and we don't expect um, cell type differences. But still we can see there are two clusters of genes that co-localize with each other. Um, so we have found two clusters of genes that co-localize with each other, but avoid the other cluster. In order to visualize what's going on here, we can select the genes that are found to co-localize and provide the same color to the group of transcripts. And then we can select the, the other cluster and we will provide a second color for the transcripts belonging to the second cluster. So we have one cluster in purple and one cluster in green. And we can actually verify the heat map finding um, in the image. It's clearly seen that the green transcripts actually co-localize with each other and the purple transcripts also co-localize with each other, but they seem to avoid. Now we have saved the results and we have a dendrogram and a heat map image file and also the raw locations as comma separated text values to explore the data we have generated further. So now it would be interesting to see what might be the reason for these two different clusterings of transcripts in different cells. And one thing that is striking is that the green transcripts are predominantly found in cells that seem to be in cell division. So it's very prominent in cells that are in cell division and the purple transcripts are found in cells that are not dividing or not have not just divided. So an assumption can be that the finding that we have made using the co-localization is not due to different cell types, but due to different cell cycle states of a homogeneous cell culture of HeLa cells. This is an example that's showing how you can draw regions of interest in the tool. It's a freehand tool and the counts on the right side will actually update while we are drawing and encircling the cells. And in this example, we have chosen to encircle two cells each. And there's two cells that are in the middle of the division process, um, two cells that have just divided, obviously. And then there's two cells where we can see no sign of cell division. And we have um, named these regions and we can now export the data um, and the data file will give us a count for every transcript in each of these three regions of interest. Um, the same export will be done uh, if a proper cell segmentation is done with hundreds or thousands of cells. One can also double click transcripts to just highlight one type um, and change quickly from one to the other. Another feature that we demonstrate now is that the transcript locations are actually containing a Z dimension. We can limit the display to certain Z planes and then we can skip through the image and we can see that on the top 
for example, the transcripts are only located in the nuclei. If we now go down again, we see first are located in the nuclei, and after that, the cytoplasm is kind of flat. Now I will walk you through the recognized website to showcase what's possible using our offering. So initially, the data to display will be loaded, and then the display will be handled by the browser. And similar to the previous case with the HeLa cells, initially the random colors, if displayed all at once, will not provide a lot of information. But which gene is displayed and which color is um, very easy to, to um, customize using this portal. And this sample is actually a section of a mouse brain and um, you can see here different markers selected that are specific for certain neuron, neural uh, cell types or subtypes of neurons. And um, you can pretty clearly see these clusters of transcripts of the same type that are more or less restricted to a certain cell. And you can even see the extensions of the cell. For example, this is a, a neuron where you can see that it's not a total round shape, but it has these axons spreading out. In addition to the display of the mere transcripts, you can also load the regions of interest. As previously shown, this can be freehand drawing. It can come from cell segmentation pipelines using image processing methods using Brightfield or DAPI images. Now we have loaded the regions of interest, the cell boundaries, and we can see that different transcripts are located inside the cells. And the cell content is actually used to cluster cells. So the cell by gene expression matrix is used to identify cells with similar expression profiles and these will be clustered into the same dimensional space. So as soon as the clustering result is present, we can see the number of clusters. The colors represent different cluster types. And for each cluster, we have depicted the three most relevant up or down regulated genes. We think this is a great help to identify your cell type of interest because you probably know the marker genes that are highly or lowly expressed. Um, so the initially grayish cells are now displayed in the color that corresponds to the cluster they are grouped into. And uh, this is a three-dimensional plot of the UMAP principal components that has been used that can be displayed alongside the actual tissue representation of the image. and in this UMAP plot, you can now encircle certain regions um, and the corresponding cells that are found in this region will then be highlighted in the tissue um, display. So you can explore the dimensional space, see what cell types are similar or very distinct, and then you can mark these cells in the UMAP plot and see where in the image are these cells located. For example, this little cluster here with this reddish cells is one of the outer layers in the cortex and the neighboring cluster is actually the cells right at the layer boundary. So if you encircle cluster in the UMAP plot, you will directly see the number of cells you have um, marked and which cluster they belong to. Um, and the initial name of the cluster will be the up or down regulated genes, but the name is actually be configurable. If you identify your cell type of interest, you can re replace the up and down regulated gene list by 
your name, you can write astrocytes or neuron or oligodendrocyte, whatever you think have identified. Um, we have some visual effects. So sometimes two genes, if they have a similar color, they're hard to distinguish um, where is the expression different and where is the expression in the whole overview the same. So we have a function that will group the transcript side by side, um, which helps to differentiate regions of high and low expression and to see where is the structure represented in the expression profile and where is the structure only seen or only demarked by uh, different other transcripts. We have some um, display where the Z dimension is exaggerated so that there's some optical separation of the transcripts and this can now go back to the original original data. So the final step or the final result of the website is actually the gene by cell expression matrix where the cells are grouped by their cluster identity and we have several options to use different color schemes for the heat map so that can suit your favorite uh, way of display high and low expressing genes. Now I would like to wrap up what I have talked about today. So I have presented two different software solutions that help to explore spatial transcriptomics data. And these should serve as tools in the hands of scientists to get most of the data that we will generate. The first tool was the plugin for ImageJ. The advantages are that you can work inside the ImageJ environment, but we have added unique add-ons to that. Um, I have shown the co-localization analysis where the heat map found co-localized genes that were unexpected in a homogeneous cell culture, but actually turned out to be markers for a cell cycle. Um, I think it was clear that the work with images um, has an advantage that the morphology can be directly compared to the transcript locations. Um, on the other hand, the website, the strength of the website solution is the statistical package that is easy to use. It's just a click of a button and then the cell by gene expression matrix will be used to cluster the cells into types and um, the identity of the cell clustering can then directly be mapped back to the original cell location without having image data to accompany that. So and the 3D UMAP plot is, uh, is a nice feature to explore the similarity and differences of different clusters and relate the identity or the gene expression types um, to the spatial location of the cells. And one of the results is finally the heat map that uh, quickly provides the information which genes are up or down regulated in which cluster. So with this, I would like to end this talk. I apologize to be not be able to be present in person. So there will be no Q&A session possible with me. Um, but I hope you have still learned a bit and uh, I have succeeded and generate some interest in what we do and i'm happy to meet you at a different location or occasion thank you for your attention and um, take care